Hi everyone, I'm Nancy Hodgson. And I'm Laura Gitlin, and we're both from the Center for Innovative Care and Aging at Johns Hopkins University. In this lecture, we're going to focus on the person with dementia and their needs as it changes over the disease trajectory. We have a few objectives today. The first is to describe what we mean by the continuum or the trajectory of Alzheimer's disease. We're going to introduce several conceptual models that will help us understand ways to intervene with our loved ones who have dementia and have unmet needs. And there are two models, the vulnerability model and the unmet needs model. And third, we're going to help you identify some key unmet needs and some ways of intervening for those unmet needs across this continuum or disease trajectory. It will help you in, in completing this week's assignment, which is to identify an unmet need that you would like to work on. We're going to start by discussing six key outcomes for any person who has dementia. And these six outcomes have been endorsed by most medical bodies in the United States and also globally. The first goal or outcome for a person with dementia is that we need to derive appropriate strategies for them to attain and maintain the highest practical level of functioning. Secondly, we need to address the frequency and severity of neuropsychiatric symptoms or behavioral challenges we need to delay institutionalization if possible and keep people in the residence of their choice. Also as part of dementia care, we need to promote caregiver and the person with dementia centered decision making and clearly involve families and the person as much as possible in the care decisions that are made throughout the trajectory. Fifth, we need to address caregiver stress and burden and finally, we need to enhance the caregiver's knowledge of and comfort with dementia care and as it changes throughout the disease trajectory. Here's one way of portraying the continuum of Alzheimer's disease. We talked a bit when we were, when we were talking about diagnosis and we were talking about the stages of illness around the preclinical stage of disease. A lot of attention has been focused on identifying this preclinical time when memories, memory does begin to show changes, um, because when we can intervene here in this early stage, uh, we can perhaps slow the course of the illness. And most of the pharmacologic treatments that we have available are most effective the earlier we can start them. But today's discussion is going to pick up around the early stage of Alzheimer's disease, when the disease has been diagnosed. And here you'll see that the dotted line shows the drop-off in cognitive functioning over time compared to the straight line, which is compared to normal aging. And it's during this precipitous drop-off in cognitive functioning that the unmet needs that we're going to talk about begin to emerge and begin to change over time as the disease progresses. Here is one of the models that we wanted to uh, familiarize yourself with. This model is going to be published in the British Medical Journal by Kales, Gitlin, and Lyketsos. And it suggests that with neurodegenerative uh, changes that are associated with dementia, there's increased vulnerabilities to various stressors that the person with dementia confronts. These stressors include factors that are specifically re related to the person with dementia, such as if they have some kind of acute medical condition, such as a urinary tract infection or pneumonia or become dehydrated, or as we will continue to discuss in this lecture, some unmet need that they're unable to communicate, such as pain or if they're having difficulty sleeping or if they feel fear or boredom or a sense of a loss of control and purpose. Other vulnerabilities concern the physical environment. The environment may be more over or under stimulating. The person may have a lack of structure and activity. And there may be a mismatch between what the environment is expecting the person to do and behave and what the person is capable of doing because of changes uh, in the brain. 
And then the third vulnerability is related to uh, family and formal caregivers. Uh, their level of stress and burden and affect can very much affect the person with dementia, the way they communicate with the person, uh, and they may have a mismatch between what they expect the person to be able to do and what the person can do. And all of these are uh, stressors to which a person with dementia becomes highly vulnerable to with disease progression. And these vulnerabilities heighten the risk for behavioral and psychological symptoms of dementia or neuropsychiatric symptoms. We also have to keep in mind that all of these vulnerability stressors can interact with each other and influence each other. And also, there are changes due to the disease process itself that may in part account for some of the behavioral symptoms that are prevalent throughout the disease process. So this is one model that shows that it's the disease process that heightens vulnerability in terms of these three broad factors that lead to uh, risk for uh, behavioral symptoms. The next model by Dr. Cohen Mansfield called the unmet needs model is another way of thinking about why individuals are expressing the, their needs at certain times. Often these unmet needs are expressed in the form of a behavior. Uh, and this need is something that may not be apparent to caregivers, family caregivers or professional caregivers. And it could be related to the presence of pain, the presence of the need for activity, boredom or loneliness. And it's expressed in terms of behavioral changes because individuals with dementia progressively lose their ability to tell us what their needs are. And so ideally, we begin by proactively identifying some common unmet needs that we'll get into shortly and show you how common unmet needs happen more, with greater likelihood depending on the, where the person is in the disease course. And so it requires us to be more proactive and much more person-centered. So here is another way to look at the disease progression, moving from normal to the severe stage of dementia. And we can map the needs that a person experiences at each of these stages, as well as potential interventions, which we're going to be discussing primarily non-pharmacologic approaches to address these needs and vulnerabilities. And the first in the early stage of disease, um, and this is in the mild cognitive impairment stage of disease, there is usually some changes expressed in terms of some anxiety. There are, the individual has some early memory changes, particularly in the area of executive dysfunction. They may have some small memory loss that often can be sometimes hidden from their loved ones. They may have some changes, subtle changes, to their ability to conduct IADLs or instructional activities of daily living, the functional things that we need to do, like paying bills, answering the phone. They may have difficulty sustaining their attention and being engaged in activities that they used to be able to sustain uh, their attention. And so the way we can help individuals in this early stage is to help engage them in health-promoting lifestyle behaviors. And that's through maintaining a healthy physical exercise program, through maintaining social ties and a healthy social network, through things like healthy diet, and also through the engagement of their cognitive abilities, staying cognitively stimulating. There's some exciting research now underway that's trying to evaluate whether setting up activities at this very early stage and having people engage in physical activity can actually slow the progression of the disease. We don't know if that is the case yet, but we do know that by providing these interventions, even at this very early stage, the mild cognitive impairment stage, that we can enhance at that point in time a person's ability to function more effectively in their environment and that they can have improved quality of life. In the next stage, uh, as we move into a definitive diagnosis uh, where individuals have received a, or have some idea that they have dementia but in the early stage, this is when we be can begin advanced care planning. 
by conducting a very thorough memory evaluation, identifying someone's strengths and weaknesses, and identifying where the deficits exist. In this stage, individuals begin to have more emotional distress, particularly as they begin to understand that they have a disease that is progressive and irreversible. They're having increased problems in maintaining um, a love of activities and sustaining their attention um, in activities that they find meaningful. The, at this stage, issues around unsafe driving often become pressing. At this stage, they're often unable to continue working because of their continued memory loss. And so things that we can do include having a family meeting to discuss the diagnosis, to discuss what it means by having dementia. Many of us still at the early stage of disease don't have a full grasp of what Alzheimer's disease means and what is the pathology behind the disease. So some basic illness education so that they have an understanding of this illness. It means thinking about advanced care planning and long-term planning. It means beginning medication, because again, the medications are effective in the earlier stages of illness, and understanding what those medications are doing. This education needs to include the caregiver. It means offering the caregiver some other skills training in how to problem solve, how to help their loved one in daily activities, and how to begin to coordinate their care. And it also is, involves providing more support for instrumental activities of daily living. At the moderate stage of the disease, we see an increase in uh, behavioral symptomology. This is where behaviors occur with greater frequency and severity and cause the most distress to the person with dementia as well as the family caregiver. In addition, we begin to see pretty dramatic declines in the person's ability to be independent or even participate in any of the instrumental activities of daily living, such as shopping or financial management uh, or laundry and housekeeping. And then we see a, the beginnings of a decline in basic self-care. So the person may need cueing in uh, brushing their teeth or other aspects of grooming and bathing and getting dressed. This is where also home safety concerns become very heightened because the person is at much greater risk of vulnerability in their home environment. And they're also at greater risk for falls and taking uh, medications inappropriately. So much greater oversight is required uh, by family members. At the moderate stage, there are a range of potential interventions uh, that may be helpful to keep the person engaged and with quality of life, such as providing activities that match the person's interests and, however, are structured to fit their best capabilities. There are various behavioral management techniques that we'll be talking about later on in the course that can be very helpful for families and formal caregivers to understand and use, such as communicating in simple, direct uh, manner. At this stage, people with dementia need a lot of reassurance. Uh, they may be very scared and anxious because of the changes that they're experiencing. They'll also need support with uh, their basic activities of daily living, and they'll need a lot of structure to their day. It's also at the moderate disease stage that we see that families uh, feel the most distressed, burdened, and need opportunities for respite. This is where families also begin to forget to take care of themselves and neglect themselves because the care for the person with dementia can be so time-consuming and all-encompassing. And finally, as we move into the severe stage of dementia, this is where the individual has lost their ability to communicate verbally with others and they've lost their ability to care for themselves, and so they're totally dependent on others for their day-to-day -day needs. It can cause a great amount of emotional distress for the family who has already been exhausted in, uh, in the earlier stages of providing caregiver, caregiving. Pain is often a very common symptom in severe stage dementia, maybe as a consequence of other underlying illnesses. And the inability to recognize pain can be a particularly challenging symptom to identify and to adequately treat, both from a pharmacologic and non-pharmacologic standpoint. 
This is also when quality of life issues become at the foremost of, of importance. Um, and so maintaining an individual's dignity and keeping them comfortable and giving them things that provide meaning to them um, and opportunities to enjoy sensory experiences become part of the, the potential interventions that we can do. And so palliative care becomes the primary model of care for individuals in the severe stage. Comfort care is another term that we use to mean that we are addressing an individual's comfort in terms of their physical pain, perhaps their emotional and spiritual pain, what we often refer to as soul pain, mm -hmm. but are dealing with all of those issues around comfort. Some of that involves the use of sens positive sensory experiences, the use of changing the environment so it's very soothing, the use of music and of touch, um, and these other types of, of methods, um, in addition to some pharmacologic management, to keep people comfortable and enjoying their, the, the, the minutes and moments that they have with, with us. This is also a time when caregivers can experience a great amount of anxiety and depression and also be in great need for respite and need a tremendous amount of caregiver support during this time. And so this was just a broad overview for, for you, a broad lecture that covers a lot of the needs that we're going to be getting into much more depth over the next few modules. Um, we'll be getting into more detail about these potential interventions going forward. So here are some take-home points from today's lecture. First, Persons with dementia confront multiple and changing challenges and needs, and these change over the disease trajectory. So it's important to evaluate the needs and vulnerabilities of the person with dementia at each stage. Challenges and needs are in large part due to the widening gap between neurodegenerative processes declining cognitive and physical abilities, and therefore increased vulnerabilities to the physical and social environment. It is possible to identify challenges in unmet needs and to introduce what we refer to as non-pharmacologic approaches, non-drug approaches, to reach the six desired outcomes in order to assure quality of life and comfort for people with dementia, regardless of the stage in which they are at in the disease trajectory. Thank you.